This is 15 Minute Fundamentals, where we interview Crypto Project's core contributors and together walk through the charts available on Token Terminal. In this episode, we discuss the basics of Gains Network, a decentralized leveraged trading platform that offers investors exposure to a wide variety of assets, both crypto and beyond. Gains launched on Polygon in late 2021 and has since also expanded to Arbitrum, where it has been live since New Year's 23. Gains has seen a total of over $27 billion in volume since launch, and their growth pace has picked up significantly over the past few months. In this episode with the project's founder, Seb, we learn about the basics of G-Trade, the drivers behind current momentum, differences between Polygon and Arbitrum, the GNS token, Gains business model, upcoming developments, and more. Hey, Seb, welcome to 50 Minute Fundamentals. It's great to have you on. Hey. Now, before we start, could you just give a quick introduction to Gains Network for anyone not yet familiar? Sure. So Gains Network right now is primarily building G-Trade, a decentralized leverage trading platform, which started on Polygon and we recently deployed on Arbitrum. Awesome. And can you break down the core features of the G-Trade for us? So the goal is to let people have exposure on as many assets as possible and as easily as possible uh, with leverage. So for example, right now we support cryptos, forex, lots of uh, stocks, US indices, and gold and silver as well. So you can take trades, which give you exposure long or short with leverage on all of these uh, assets and pairs. Got it. So you provide investors with exposure to a lot of different assets. Now, what would you say are the main innovations that you've introduced to the market with G-Trade? Yeah, so the main uh, thing that makes us different than other perpetual platforms is the fact that we are an Oracle-based platform. So that means there is no order books. So basically, when a trade happens, it's not uh, like we match sellers and buyers. It's just basically you open your position and it's synthetic. It stores the price you open that, uh, the pair, like the leverage, collateral, Role and everything and then when you close it it just asks the oracle again for the current price and it sends you the right amount of die that you have left based on obviously if the trade went in the right direction or not in your leverage so it's fully oracle based and synthetic cool and how does being an oracle based platform benefit your users in practice so mainly uh, the fact that we can support very high leverage uh, without like having liquidity issues because that's generally the problem with order books. To support high leverage, you need really deep liquidity. Otherwise, you will get pretty instant slippage on your orders when you try to execute them. And also the fact that um, we can support many, many pairs. So right now we have about 80 pairs listed on the platform, all with a single dive pool which we call the GDI vault and is the fact that we can have a single pool for all of these pairs because there is no order book per pair that lets us have this many pairs uh, with uh, just about 20 million TVLs on Arbitrum for example oh sorry I'm, I mean 30 million we've grown quite a lot recently so 30 million on Arbitrum and like 13 million on Polygon yeah always a positive problem to be growing so fast that you can't keep up with the numbers right <laughs> yeah now if we dive into your financial financials a bit. Can you give us a walkthrough of how the G-Trade system works economically, uh, which also ties into your business model? So what are the stakeholders involved? Who pays fees for what? And how does the GNS token tie into all of this? So the main revenue, of course, is the fees generated by uh, the trades. So for example, the Die Vault, which provides the immediate counterparty to all of these trades, gets a, a nice share of the fees. Then we also have what we call our NFT bots, which are bots uh, run by the community where you need an NFT to run them. And they basically trigger all the limit orders, stop losses, take profits and everything. Because you know on the blockchain, nothing happens by itself. So if there is an order to be triggered, you need a an actual network of bots to execute them. Uh, so they get a share of the fees as well. And of course, we have the GNS token. So it has two main utilities. The first one is that it makes the GDI vault even more liquidity efficient because we have a mint and burn mechanism where if the vault is over collateralized, a share of the negative traders PNL is used to buy and burn GNS OTC, which puts deflationary pressure on the supply and on the opposite when the vault 
is under collateralized. We use GNS and mint it OTC and uh, sell it to anybody who wants to buy it from the vault at a rate of maximum 18% inflation per year, which allows to refill the vault even faster than just using the trader's losses. So that, uh, that helps for the collateralization. That's the main use case. It improves the liquidity efficiency even more. And we also, for example, for some of the fees, like NFT bots, the DAI, instead of paying NFT bots with DAI, we send the DAI to the vault and we pay uh, the NFT bots in GNS, which also supports the constantly growing collateralization of the vault. And for example, if we feel that uh, we have enough of our collateralization or that the rate of increase is too high and we don't need uh, that much room, then we can increase the burn and, for example, bring the inflation back to zero or even uh, turn GNS into deflationary token once we have enough over collateralization, which is basically a safety buffer because so when a trader loses, currently it goes into what we call the over collateralization layer because we created the GDI vault so that uh, liquidity providers are not not exposed to the trader's PNL. It was uh, quite important for us because we wanted to provide a, a product where you can just put die and get uh, predictable fees instead of mixing a PNL with that. So the idea is, uh, as a GDI vote provider, you uh, just get the fees generated by the volume. And if it's over collateralized, then traders lose a bit. It goes into an over collateralization layer, which makes it less likely to go under 100% collateralization. So it acts as a safety buffer for stakers, because in the case of course, if it goes under 100%, then you will start losing proportionally on your deposit, because we cannot let people withdraw more than there is in the vault. So that's the, the main idea. And so the second use case for GNS will be governance because we want to fully decentralize even the, the growth and the operation of the protocol once we, we have the most important features uh, done. Thank you for the comprehensive overview. Now, you spoke about NFT bots, and I want to discuss the GNS NFTs and their use cases in a bit more detail because they seem quite unique. Do you want to speak a bit about the different use cases that these GNS NFTs have? So as a trader, they will reduce the spread a bit. When you open a trade, uh, you can run an NFT bot with it, which lets you trigger limit orders and get a share of the fees. And finally, you can, so, you know, we redistribute also a lot. Uh, I would say even the biggest share of the revenue we send is to GNS takers in our GNS single side staking pool. And alongside your GNS, you can also stake NFT uh, which boost your APR as well. And the precise values can be found in the documentation. Yeah, cool. I'll, I'll link that into the show notes. Now, if we pull up your key metrics chart on Token Terminal, we'll see that you've had a really positive momentum that started around New Year's. What have been the main drivers behind this increase in traction? So I would say the, the main catalyst for that growth has been Arbitrum. We deployed there actually exactly on the New Year. And uh, the, the first week has been a bit slow, uh, but then it, it exploded uh, really fast and TVL has been growing a lot volume we've done uh, all-time high in daily volume and uh, weekly volume as well it has been quite sustained and yeah we've done our january has been our biggest month in fees so far so it's going really well and tvl is following as well which is nice to see awesome that's great to hear now that you are live on both polygon and arbitrum what have you learned about the main differences between the two and are you noticing any big differences in the user behavior type of usage you see on each of these chains Arbitrum is a bit more expensive than Polygon, so I think we tend to see a bit more whales on Arbitrum. It's also slightly faster, so like if you do short-term trading like scalping, Arbitrum is really good for that. Trades only settle in a few seconds and it's almost instant. And we, we also are the only decentralized pair right now to have what we call one-click trading, which is a way to open trades and like interact with the trading platform without having to to go through the metamask confirmation which you know is is pretty annoying like you click on the button it takes 10 seconds to load then <laughs> you do scroll down click confirm 
etc. So we we save the user 10 seconds per trade approximately uh, with that feature that uh, we invented and that we are the only ones to have currently. So it's pretty easy. It just uh, generates a new private key from your main uh, wallet, which uh, gives you access to the DAI in your main wallet. And you can trade from this new private key directly without having to use the MetaMask confirmations because then, uh, of course, it's stored in the browser. So you can just click on a button and it does a transaction without any confirmation, which I think is uh, pretty big uh, for the UX. Advantage is uh, it's much uh, cheaper, the gas fees. So if you do like small trades, uh, it's better. Also, since gas is more expensive on Arbitrum, it's more expensive for our oracles as well. So we cannot accept uh, as low position sizes as we do on, on Polygon. So for example, if you trade with uh, low size, uh, it's possible you, the minimum position size on Arbitrum is a bit too high. Uh, so in this case, I recommend using Polygon. It's still really good and fast. And yeah, gas fees tend to be, uh, I would say, about five times cheaper. Yeah, so both have their pros and cons, and there's a clear incentive for you to keep building on both. Yeah, it's also nice because Polygon will be like uh, more going uh, to work on ZK Tech and uh, Arbitrum is a roll-up, optimistic roll-up, so we have both. That's a good position to be in, yeah. And momentum-wise, like you said, you're in a good place. Arbitrum has been driving most of the growth. And if we look at the composition by chain on your dashboard, we can see that the volumes on Arbitrum have already actually overtaken Polygon. And it'll be quite exciting to watch how this keeps developing. I wanted to also ask about challenges. Is there currently anything that you're struggling with at Gains? So actually, the, the growth has been uh, pretty smooth the last few months. We've started to finally get noticed on Twitter, for example, and uh, on various platforms. So <laughs> everything has been growing quite nicely. Uh, we've, we've struggled for quite a while with that. Like our level of recognition was way below the, the product uh, we offered. But now it's starting to catch up. So we are still very, very uh, early and not, not many people know us. But uh, we're start starting to see some good momentum and feels great yeah I, I can imagine that definitely frustrating to know you have a solid product but having it be kind of under the radar getting to where we are now with uh, big volumes and everything has been even more of a priority than uh, developing the product because we knew we already had a, a fantastic product even one year ago and uh, volumes could have been 10 times higher already so and we all know that uh, a great product without adoption is nothing so yeah we've really put a lot of emphasis on that and since of course it doesn't take all day long to do marketing we've also made a lot of progress on the platform at the same time so yeah i'm happy with getting recognition being like one of your main business development focus areas for some time what else have you currently been focusing on from a day-to-day -day operations perspective? So I would say right now we are at a stage where exposure is getting pretty good. Like we just need to keep going with the momentum. You know, for example, we did a, we, we right now have a 100k trading uh, contest running on Arbitrum to really kickstart uh, the launch there. And we're still really much focused on Twitter. I would say it's the main part of our marketing strategy. And recently we also partnered with uh, crypto banter on youtube for example to get uh, some good exposure on youtube as well but i would say that the biggest part is is pretty much twitter yeah also of course making as as many partnerships as possible especially with uh, gdi or new vault which is really the composability is really good so you can build easily on it and uh, recently chidao so you know the my stable coin will support i mean they just listed gdi as a collateral so it's a really Really, really good uh, yeah it's a great start i mean i'm really happy because the plan for gdi was uh, mainly to be a collateral so like you could deposit die in the vault get gdi borrow in this case like mint my then you can do even more stuff with your my it's been the main goal with this vault because we've really focused on uh, interoperability and conversability so i'm glad to see it play out and yeah i'm really happy with uh, this first partnership with uh, gdao and my that all sounds great I wanted to speak a bit about community contributors and their role within the games ecosystem. As you mentioned, that you want to decentralize every part of it. What kind of community contributions and activity do you see at the moment? 
I would say so community mainly focuses on like sharing the platform and uh, the protocol uh, with others to make it grow. And they also give us nice suggestions uh, on the UX and uh, stuff we can improve. But um, I hired a few devs from the community already. So a few of them joined, uh, joined the team. But uh, yeah, outside from that, it, it's uh, we take suggestions from the community and, uh, and apply them when, uh, when it's relevant. Then I have just one final question, which is what's next for games? Is there anything you can share from your mid to long term roadmap? So we're in a really good place right now. I'm really happy because the vault was a foundational piece of the protocol and I'm really glad it's done. But I would still say we missed quite a few uh, super high impact things that will make the UX even even better and the growth and everything. So a few of them are, for example, multi-collateral. So right now we have the GDI vault, but we could launch like a GBTC vault or a GEther vault, which will uh, allow people to deploy it for example ether and then it would let people trade with ether which would be uh, really really good because far as or like uh, usdc wrap bitcoin anything i think it's pretty big because for example if you have usdc and you want to trade on the platform right now you have to swap or and you get uh, of course a swap fee then depending on the decks you use so it's not the great ux for that part and it will also allow us to like diversify the risk from only depending on that and like having stuff like wrap bitcoin wrap ether and it's a really nice way of growing the TVL as well, I think, because the APR generally on, on stuff like Bitcoin and Ether can be fairly low, like 3-4%, I think is already quite competitive. So yeah, I'm really excited about that because it's uh, pretty much in Traders UX, new collateral, and also for the TVL side. But there's also something like a partial adding and uh, closing of trades, because right now you can only, you cannot really update your position size on your trade once it's open. So it's a bit, uh, could be a bit tricky depending on what trading strategy you use. So I'm excited uh, to have that available as well. And another big one, I think, uh, is what we call the lookbacks update, which will allow us to guarantee the execution of all limit orders on the platform, which will let us truly reach our potential as an Oracle-based uh, uh, leverage platform. Because basically, since everything is synthetic, we can really decide the price at which orders are triggered so and the thing is so right now it's possible that let's say if the price goes up really really fast like let's say in 0.1 second it touches your take profit and then it drops back down the issue with the current system is the nft bot will say it will see the price go up above your order it will say okay you need to it will make a oracle request to trigger it but the issue is by the time oracle uh, post the answer on chain it's possible the price is not there anymore so the idea is that oracles would keep for example the last two three minutes of prices in memory and then they could see uh, when uh, an nft bot wants to trigger a take profit for example or um, they can check the like the last two three minutes of prices instead of just, of just the current one and they will see oh there was a week above it so we can trigger it and then uh, that will be really really good i think because a platform where every single order is guaranteed, uh, I don't think that exists yet. Because right now we have guaranteed stop losses on, on crypto. So if the price drops below your stop loss, you can never lose more than uh, your stop loss. So even if it's triggered a bit late, it will still trigger at the price you set. But we don't have that yet on other asset classes due to a few reasons like gaps and market hours. And we don't have that yet on take profits, for example. So I'm really excited to have that as well. I think it would be huge. That all sounds exciting. Lots to look forward to. Thank you so much, Seb, for taking the time to give us this quick overview of Games Network, and I hope I can host you again in the future. Awesome. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.